I now invite Niti along with Sam Grant and Nazir Khan uh, to like uh, just share with us their thoughts and like have a bit of a conversation. Um, Sam is a long time environmental justice organizer, um, both locally here in the Twin Cities and Minnesota, but also with the Sierra Leone Foundation for New Democracy, doing amazing uh, work in Western Africa. Um, and Nazir is an organizer um, and friend to many of us in this room who's uh, really been pushing the environmental justice movement in uh, the, this area in very interesting directions. Um, so we're really glad that all, like, we're, we're thankful in advance, all of you. So if I could invite you to come and, and, and sit up in front over here, and maybe first we could hear from Sam and Nazir your thoughts, uh, or react, like brief thoughts and reactions. <laughs> so to begin, um, put your hand on your heart and say, I am Porto Mocha. Look at the person next to you and say, you are Porto Mocha. <laughs> hold your hands out to hold the whole world and say, we are Porto Mocha. We really are. Is there any more to say? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Nitty for sharing this story with us. Um, I think very quickly about the myth that we've all been invited to join when we come to the academy to get an education so we can go out there and add to this pathological pattern of quote unquote civilization. And as Nitty shared with us, it's really growth equals decline. In order to grow, we're destroying the basis of life. So the question that we have to consider is how might we begin the journey in this circle right now to live by other means in relationship to the earth, in relationship to each other, and to co-construct the healing capacity to nourish conviviality into the future. So this is the necessary journey of people who recognize that we are not citizens, we are earthlings. <clears throat> As earthlings, we have an obligation to the earth and to each other. And when you think about structural violence, it's hard to tell that we know who we are. So Prince has this great song called The Colonized Mind. And I feel like we are all embodying that to too large of an extent, which is a form of self-violence. And so the first request that I ask of you and ask of me and ask of us is that we decolonize this, we decolonize this, and we decolonize this, the relation that we have with each other. If we take responsibility for that journey, then the world that we want to midwife in relation, it begins to breathe. Um, yeah, I think I was struck, but hard to follow that up. <laughs> uh, I was pretty, I don't know, I feel like um, the, 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 the opening video with the, getting his name, Lado Sikaka, Lado Sikaka um, so rarely in our movements do we see the people who are actually impacted, this most directly um, given the space to speak and uh, taking leadership and like just you know speaking in that way um, the, the camera the camera is not on them um, their leadership is not like recognized their I think um, they're often put in you know it, even in like the current sort of stuff around the Green New Deal and Minnesota has a hundred percent renewable or clean energy um, and I think even in my own organizing I think it sometimes falls into that that like those people are seen like in a very frontline communities are seen in like in a utilitarian way that like because they're the most impacted they should be devising the solutions but the solutions to what um, to like an, to putting a you know a temporary fix on like what is like I think from from this presentation like a, a much much deeper problem and 
Yeah, and then I, I think also um, the uh, just, you know, I feel like we're in a movement moment right now, especially in the US where it, like there's people feel like they're waking up and, you know, action, a lot of young folks are doing actions on Congress people and, you know, there's youth climate strikes and without disrespecting that energy and like I think it is, it is and I'm definitely inspired and a part of that movement, I think um, it needs to be recognized that, you know, when you watch all the fights that are happening in India, that this is, this is a, a long time that people have been fighting. Um, and that, you know, yeah, there's, in, a, in what feels like in a much deeper and more powerful way than like, we, you know, we're, we're pushing for what a Green New Deal, I think people are pushing to, not just to survive, but to, to restore us to a way of being that has been lost to most of us. Um, and so, yeah, I, it just, I think it, it makes me think a lot more deeply about well, where we are in our movement and what are we, what are we actually pushing for? Um, and how do we be in solidarity and communication with those who are in a much more, I think, frankly, like a revolutionary place um, and in touch with, you know, we talk about revolution in this way. I feel a lot of us who want that and who like get what that could, what that could mean as though it, it doesn't, it's never existed or it doesn't yet exist. And, um, and I feel like there's in that video and then like in the presentation that uh, there's plenty of places to look where people are actually in that revolutionary state of being already. And we are participating in an economy and in a politics that actually is destroying that state of being. And like, how do we reset to like, think about, you know, that it already exists in front of us basically. Some straight thoughts. Okay. Got questions from the audience. We can take a couple and then turn it over to them for responses. I Um, I don't know what it is that we're trying to replace. I would definitely replace the people who are currently articulating the problem and the solution. Uh, I would try and put in the center stage those voices that are not being heard now, which is the people who are fighting against the Dakota Access Pipeline or the L3 or the L5 or the L15 or or the uh, copper mine over there or the Navajo Nation who are fighting against a coal mine or the people in India who are fighting against various mines and other development projects. They need to be heard. We are not hearing them now. We are hearing the uh, politicians. We are hearing other charismatic people who have used their privilege to occupy democratic space rather than use that privilege to create space for other people to speak. Uh, I think the people in the front line who are the receiving end must be asked, what is the problem? Probably they will say that the stock exchange is the problem and dismantle the stock exchange. It's just a talk. They might say that. And are we prepared to hear that through? We don't have to come to the point of what is the solution when we don't even know what is the problem that we are trying to solve. And I'm not from that community. I, I belong to the exploitative civilization. I'm squarely in that. I'm trying to lend solidarity to uh, a civilization that I can sense, I can be in solidarity with, but I don't have the courage to live that life. And I want community with me to help me transition to what I know is a healthier way of living. And in that way of life, people will be respected. Primarily the ones, the ones who will be the experts are the ones who know, who are wise about the land, not the clever ones who create problems and then solve it. So I would look at it more from a philosophical side rather than looking at a blueprint for what the new economy will look like. I know what the new economy will not look like is something that exploits nature, exploits people, cannot be part of a sustainable economy. And the models that we are seeing currently fail on both counts, including the alternatives. So just this afternoon, we had a small conversation. If the problem is framed 
in a manner where it can be solved without rocking the boat, then the framing of the problem is wrong. So we will have to frame the problem in a manner that solving it will essentially turn over the status quo. How that is done, it's not a very easy job. It's very easy to sit here and say this. But I'm saying that just because it is difficult does not mean we do the wrong thing, which is what we're doing now. This whole, you know, I heard this very interesting American phrase about low hanging fruit. We've only been gathering low hanging fruit. The high hanging fruit is social equity and respect for nature. We're never getting there because we are, every time we pluck one low hanging fruit, another fruit shows up. <laughs> Uh, I have one comment. I think uh, the, the Bernardo C. Pankas video kind of clarified uh, this too, because I think uh, he has a very clear notion of the state. Right? And I think in uh, when you're principal and legal science, I think the notion of state is one way of putting constraints on what you can do. And one of the problems with that is that I think the technology mindset and uh, purely technological mindset says there's no constraints. Anything is possible. So when you have no constraints, and one of those topics on exploiting and just uh, it seems that there is any model that you want to, I mean, it seems like you need to kind of recover the sense of sacred, which is another way of saying that you can be a low constraints on what you can do really move around. And so you kind of end up with uh, building, you can build all the panels, you can kind of make MA, I mean, efficient, efficient uh, tools, and you can kind of just consume a lot of those. And how we can prove that kind of constraints that we are constrained words and definitely the analytical is a very instinctive kind of thing. We have to take it from that kind of perspective. We cannot touch it. This is sacred. Right. So, that's the problem. You mentioned that, uh, so first of all, I agree with most of what you said uh, in your talk. And I also agree with the fact that uh, we should find innovative solutions. Well, I think that I, I, I disagree with your definition of the problem. I don't think death is a problem. Quality of life or a bad quality of life is a problem. A person can live for eight years inside a, inside a prison. Do you consider that to be a successful living? And if, you, if you look at a place like the US where uh, there's, a, there's a certain amount of longevity, people are very insecure. They work all their life to be able to have a comfortable retirement. So basically they spend all the time that they should be having fun preparing for death. I think that's a very, very bleak thing. And, and when you're ready to die and you desperately want to go, you can't because technology is preventing you and this really misplaced notion of love for the loved ones is just preventing you from just leaving. I think death is a given. You, 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 sorry? Not at 46. Ah, sure. 46 is totally okay. As long as I have a party till 46, I'm okay. <laughs> I mean, the, the issue is what is the quality of life that you have? I mean, it's a miss. What I've been talking about over here is I find that there is a matrix. And when I first came to study in America, I thought that here I'm coming into a very, very privileged society. And I thought I was a brown man entering white privilege. And all my white friends were older and had at least $80,000 in loans. Where are they going to speak for others? I mean, they can't speak for themselves because they're, they're enslaved at college level. And MRI machine is the last of my concern. Is there water in the river? If there is no water in the river, the MRI machine is not going to save you. So I think that the, the one, definitely we need, to, we need to figure out not just how to live, but we also know, need to know how to die. We, don't, we have lost that art of dying. Do you have any thoughts on the previous question? I appreciate the, the first question that came up. And you know, I do a lot of work helping people reimagine like 
So if we don't want this, what do we want? We have learned the art of critique, <clears throat> but we've lost the capacity to, to be co-creative. And so a very important process is for us to take out a piece of paper or to take out um, a canvas or to, to make a space to dance or to sing or to, to, to play with an instrument um, and imagine in our hearts, what do we want to create? What does that look like? And how is it truly different than what we are in past? I, in my younger days, listening to the community as a transformative organizer, I heard people in my community say, Sam, we need to have a financial institution we can own and control because none of us feel welcome to go into the banking industry in the United States of America. So we did a research project and we decided that the solution was to create a community-owned financial infrastructure. So we created a community development credit union. It wasn't until we created the community development credit union that I found out that just having a institution is inadequate if the culture hasn't shifted, if the relationships haven't shifted. So there is something very, very basic in terms of how we relate to each other. And so in the work that Nitty shared with us, he was working with and listening to people he's now in solidarity with who were saying, we are the front line. The mountain we live on is the front line. The water that we, our lives rely on is the front line. We're all the same. We are all one. And we have lost all of that and come into a cosmology of consumption and production. And so part of the journey is to think about what does it look like to live in relation, to live in balance. So as the indigenous people in, in South America say, let's learn to live well instead of learning to live better. So one simple question is for us to consider, what would it look like for us to begin to de-link from needing to consume more, needing to do more, needing to produce more, and to take more time to visit with each other? more time to relax, more time to sleep, more time to make good food together, um, and to share the burden and the opportunity of all of the productive things that we need to do to take care of the common basis of life. What would that look like? I got my students to think about the, this project in North Minneapolis. So you know, he's talking about Chennai and this terrible process of economic development that's always about destroying the earth and destroying local culture. So in North Minneapolis, we have our own version of that, there was a terminal for uh, ships to go up and down the river that became you know, dormant for many, many years. And the city finally decided to develop this. And they got these developers together. The developers put together a concept plan and they presented it to the community and all of these community meetings. Said, Isn't this great? Isn't this wonderful? Sign on, say yes. And the community said, this is horseshit. <laughs> and the developers in the city were like, oh, we thought it was really nice. What's wrong? <laughs> oh, they didn't have enough water. They didn't have enough love in their childhoods. They don't understand it. Let's ignore them, right? So even though the community said this plan needs to be rejected, the plan was approved 100% by the city council. So now the community is trying to think about between now and November, when the next stage of environmental and economic review happens, how does the community put in place a different imagination of what this could look like? And to what extent does putting that different imagination in place open up the insight of the city and of developers about a very different approach to how we do this work. So it's not about running away from the world that we're in, but it's about building our capacity to negotiate from a place of complete integrity to the extent we can get there to say we will not allow certain things to happen anymore. So the people that, you know, Nitty was, was showing us in, in the film are saying, um, you're not going to come and take this mountain. You are not going to come and take this mountain. We're here. We don't have enough people with that level of, of courage. Now, I went to Standing Rock with my students, and we went there on election, the, 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 the eve of the election of uh, the guy who's in the White House right now. And we woke up the next morning, and my students were like, man, what are the people here going to say about this guy who's now in the White House? And they were really freaking out about the conversation with the community and what the community said. We've been fighting, you know, this kind of, you know, pathological behavior for 500 years. So this is nothing new to us. <laughs> um, so we invite you to help us construct what we want to create. So my students worked on building yurts and then doing outdoor education with the students in the Water is Life School. So they were already completely embodying this alternative, you know, imagination. The cosmology was living and breathing. 
And so how do we, as Nitty talked about, what does it look like for everybody in this room to leave this, this circle and go out and practice day-to-day -day reciprocal solidarity on a very deep level with people who are on the quote-unquote front lines, not just of climate change, but of the 600-year pattern that has generated climate change. What does that look like? And I think that's part of the journey, is to think about getting there. And to get to the gentleman in the back's question about quality of life, I think it's really important to unpack the myth of progress. And we won't necessarily agree on what that means to us, but I think it's a necessary dialogue. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think it's really necessary. Right? It's just funny because we're like in the mechanical engineering. <laughs> 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 and I feel like this is where MRI machines get modified. And I know there's, I know that Medtronic is, uh, I used to walk these hallways organizing mechanical engineering faculty into a faculty meeting. So I, kn I know that they'd all agree with you. You're, you're like the spirit of your or would bring up that question as a but I think um, yeah I think like we're at a point where well first of all I would say that like you know I don't even agree with the premise of like sort of that develop like that technological development is the solution to human development that's sort of the I feel like the premise of your question is that more talent like um, you know, mortality has improved because of all, like, essentially because of, you know, Western capitalism and, and the technological development that's been, or no, not that. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I think, uh, well, leave, leave that part. I, I think that to technological development um, is, I, I'm not inherently against that. I think that's great. But I think, you know, there's even places in India where, uh, people have low per capita income and a really high life expectancy, like Kerala, for example, right? Um, and so it's not necessarily the case that, and I think actually, you know, the hashtag man, uh, Modi, <laughs> his own state, Gujarat, is a disaster. And it was like his whole um, presentation as an argument as the leader of, you know, the modernizer and leader of India is that he will, modernize and bring India into the future and provide jobs and, you know, uh, provide economic growth. And what has that led to is he's, he's removed environmental regulations. He, I mean, India has dropped from, I think, 170, it, was, it used to be 150 something in the most, like, most serious environmental problems, I'm forgetting the exact statistic, and it has plummeted to 177 during his term out of 180. It is the fourth worst environmentally polluted place in the world because of that argument that technology, essentially that technological development and economic growth is the solution to human development. I think that's a, that is an argument of the colonizer, essentially. That, I mean, that is I period the argument. Human development, I just use the word, uh, I just use the life expectation of the human development. But then there is a principle of mathematics that says in the next policy because of the like all the documents and follow. And so the assumption being made is that, well, you have to have MRI machines to, you know, have the expectancy of uh, tribal people growing up. And maybe that's a false assumption. But there are no primary health centers in many yeah. tribal regions in India. And maybe that's the cause for not having, uh, you know, the, the, the life expectancy of tribal people. Right? So if you have to get the life expectancy of tribal people growing up, you don't need centers to build. Mm -hmm. You don't need to build a fort in the night somewhere. You probably need to build like primary healthcare centers in those regions, which is not why you can build big enough. I mean, first you could get to the, you know, so I take it through without a function. And I actually, Kerala has, has one of the best. Yeah. Am I a machine with just an example? Sure, no, no, no. I think <laughs> the yeah. point is well taken, actually. Yeah. Because I think there is. Well, while I did say that these things about the life expectancy, I totally get it. Very near and dear one is, you know, uh, is in difficulty. We do want to prolong their life. We all do it. So I, I, I agree with that. But I'm saying that that is for people talking within the same culture. I've not heard the same things said in other cultures, like in, in, in Lado Sikaka's culture. It is 47, 50 people die and it is accepted. They're not clamoring for it. Is that what they are clamoring for? Like the gentleman over there said, 
there is definitely a need to prevent neonatal mortalities. That people see as a very important thing. That children need to have at least 45, 50 years. You might say 50, you might say 80. I'm not saying, I'm not going to sit down there and decide what a cutoff limit might be. Somebody else might say 120. If you can live for 120 years in a productive, you know, and a happy way, you know, all power to you. But to say that 80 is the cutoff and everybody should aspire for that, and that is, that is something I think is definitely, I see that as we are aging, the pharma companies also are making a killing. And I find a very close connection between longevity, longevity and the stock market, you know, performance of these big companies. So we'll take a couple more questions in a row so that we have nice. Yeah. Um, a couple of days back, with science for the people who we were having a conversation of how, or, mm, how scientists um, have created this bubble almost of like being the beacons of knowledge and whatever, and um, how they need to be more, or they need to get into more of advocacy and things like that, and have better communication with the community. And I was just like wanted to open that kind of discussion topic as to what advice you, you all could have, or um, what would you like to see from this niche of like scientists or university goers to like get into? Would you like to? Yeah, uh, I was just gonna say, I think what has helped clarify some of these things for me is I think speaking a little bit to your comments about like cultural shifts and, and a lot of the things that, that everyone's bringing up, um, like an anti-capitalist type of stance. I think the thing that I hear really is what if we take exploitation off the table? What does the world look like, right? And I think once you start saying that, then you start getting clarification and questions like that where science is held up as objectively true. Well, if it's exploiting, you know, then it's not neutral, right? It's not value neutral. And so I think you might be able to start to say what you won't accept, which is exploitation, which is what I heard in that first video. You know, they were talking about don't destroy our lands, right? Like they don't want that to be exploited. Like whatever outcomes come from that, that's their value, right? You know, and that goes through a lot of stuff, I think. And yeah, um, I didn't really have a question, but just uh, a framework potentially that could be helpful in this concept um, from geography is this idea of uneven development. So, like, the idea is that, like, capitalism always creates development, but in an unevenly distributed way. And so, you know, there's an argument that, like, you know, all of these systems will, like, lift all boats. But then at the same time, especially if you're talking about mining and extraction, you know, you're talking about child labor and you know, poisoning people. And I think there's a there's a, a class thing and life expectancy thing that you're looking at. And and it's really important to think about and like what does it like they want and um, you know, I think yeah, not just like completely dismissing the idea of technology is helping is not going to help us as well. Um, either, uh, yeah. Um, so in the, uh, in the department that I work, I don't directly work in ecology or uh, ecology or anything, but uh, in, I work in an ecology department and I hear a lot of talk about ecosystem services and valuing and putting a value on ecosystems. And um, when I raise the problem that you cannot put a monetary value on it, and it becomes problematic when you put a monetary value on it, I'm a show up that it won't necessarily be a monetary value and that all <laughs> stakeholders will be listened to. And I, I find that very, I'm very skeptical of that. I'm just, I just wanted to ask you what, what, what is your take on it? What, how do you think that, like it's getting, I feel like it's getting a lot of traction among scientists and that's what you know, just, I think both of yeah. the comments are kind of related. Uh, mm -hmm. One, I think that uh, when you say, what should scientists do? There is an assumption that scientists are one breed of people who have one training and there is one way of knowing. I think that the first thing that anybody who claims to be a scientist should do is to open themselves up to different ways of knowing and different ways of articulating. Lado Sikaka is a scientist. He said, you remove the river, you remove the mountain, the river will disappear. That is a scientific statement because it's a bauxite river and a Nina reductionist way of understanding sites. If you remove the river, if you remove the, uh, the hill, the river will disappear. He made a very 
empirical statement that can be so but understanding his way of articulating is about values as well and our scientists are talking about a value neutral approach that is hugely problematic because you cannot have value neutral science or value neutral technology it is located inside a context uh, so i think that in the, in the same the same way who are you to have a stakeholder consultation when did you become part of the state this is not your state this mountain was not yours to mess around with don't value it don't do it i think that what is being done is that it is i think comes from a good place it comes from a place that we want to communicate we want to convince other people and the other people only understand the knowledge the the words of dollars and now more and more car but i'm saying that you know i was talking to a friend this morning about uh, why everybody is jumping on the climate change is it this is the flavor of the month or the season i don't want the flavor of the season just give me vanilla <laughs> no the flavor of the season is a problem because we keep going out of the flavor is the flavor is decided by somebody else i don't even like that so this ecosystem service that is the i think the way i talk about it but then the, within uh, the economics as the environmental economics who want to put a fixed number to it and ecological economics who are talking about values so how do you what kind of a number are you going to put to the the, the music that comes out when you're just out in the open you know what dark dollar value does that have? the only some things that are monitors in ties it so those are limitations i think that it is a very fraught exercise it has to be pot to the nail and this whole stakeholder consultation does not make sense because it comes from it doesn't come from a flat society it comes from a position of power and i think that nobody who is very closely related to the land would be able to agree to putting dollar values or rupee values on ecosystem services if you just google native people and we are not stakeholders there's some articles that you come up on <laughs> where they're sort of critiquing the whole notion of being stakeholders so i i'm completely in agreement with nidhi and i think it's important to sort of step back and think about um, the language we're using and so part of what indigenous people inform us of when we practice our pitiful forms of solidarity you know with them um is that um your language sort of defines who you are and how you live and if you have lost a language of relationship to the land if you have lost your connection on a moment to moment basis with what is sacred then maybe you've already lost your life and so i think part of what civilization means it's the zombie apocalypse right we're already in the zombie apocalypse with civilization so to get to the question on science um i was on a panel about 14 years ago with some scientists talking about working with indigenous populations and i said you all say that indigenous people's cosmology and practice is ethno science and that what you do is real science well i want to say any science that's based on extraction and exploitation is an ethno science of 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 destruction it's an ethno science so you can't call that more legitimate right so when i think about science for the people and i tease my colleagues who are with science for the people about this i think you should change the name to science with the people <laughs> um, because i think that we have to democratize the practice of science and recognize that the journey is to practice collaboration around the science of living well together that's what life is life is the science of living well together that's all it is how do we do that well and we keep learning and healing with each other and it gets better and better It's a very brief comment. Six, my name is Shiny. Six word blind me there. It's also very interesting how we can use the term, which is defined by somebody, a professional service or a manual service, to coin this term. And where does it come from? And then suddenly you think of more putting values. Uh, on the one hand, you have language which is being dismissed, and there is other kind of what language is being created, and then it becomes commoditized, and so. Why not? Because it's a function. If you want to talk about something that's happening scientifically in the soil and in the in the environment and in the ecosystem, why not talk about it as a function? Because it cannot be as easily commodified. I just kind of have an observation after this. You know, our university and many others around the country are now into the whole. Notion of grand challenges, and now we put together teams of people from three different disciplines, and they will fix things. Yeah. Because 
problem is that we haven't had more than one discipline looking at the problem. And, you know, I mean, what they ought to have is you guys standing there. Um, I don't know, how do we, how do we deal with that? And with that, like that, and any closing thoughts if we're nearing time or around. Yeah, I mean, I think the university is the problem, actually. Yeah. I think I've been dreaming and talking to people for several months now about going to some Econ 101 classes and <laughs> doing an action because like <laughs> the whole class is, I mean, that's the, that's the ideological training ground for, you know, like high growth. Uh, the, the thing that is taking us over the cliff, um, whether, you know, I think you can think it's climate change or what, whatever, like it's, it's, it's right there. And this is the, yeah, this is the place where things like ecosystem services, valuation, and all kinds of crazy shit gets <laughs> invented and coined. And, um, and it's also, I think, a really like, in, you know, in India, um, universities are a site of struggle. You know, like it's, it's where the BJP, which is a fascist government, is uh, going after, like, it's, it has an intellectual political project get rid of you know people who disagree with its way of thinking from universities so universities are a really important place and i think science for the people is very i think it's it's time <laughs> that it came back thank god um and yeah and i i i i it's why i partly organize here too i think it's really it, this is you know a lot of the stuff that we see in the community um uh, the, the very worst things coming out of the city council or coming from real estate development corporations get validated and um, perfected and thought up and uh, branded in the university. I mean, in these, in these halls of science right here, like, you know, you have all sorts of corporate, whether it's Cargill or Monsanto or, you know, or pharmaceutical companies just validating what they're doing. And so it, this is a really important, it, it, it's, it's actually, I think, not the place, I, we need a different term than grand challenge, just because we're like, <laughs> grand like struggle of, or grand rebellion or something, because this is, I, I feel like these are really, and that's partly why I wanted to engage in, I think it is actually really important that we get into debate and that we, um, like as an organizer, that we engage with like, um, with folks who, you know, I think the, I don't know what your name was, but the sort of point of view that he brought up is, this room is an exception. I feel like if you go around the university, that is the norm, that is like the belief that, like we, we would be considered crazy, I feel like a lot of the ways that we're talking about things in this room. Um, and so I think it's, it's, but, and yet I feel like deeply in my soul that like, we are like, it's, it's time we fought back like we're right, like it, it's, you know, like it's, it's ridiculous that this still exists and it's partly a result of, and I feel like that's an organizing challenge for anyone in this room who wants to engage in that challenge, come talk to me and talk to science for the people because we need people who are willing to go and start talking to people and breaking this down and saying, no, this is, it's, it, it's beyond too late. Like we need Econ 101 to go away. We need all this crazy like ecosystem valuation stuff to, to stop and we need to completely redirect or we need to just end the university period. <laughs> oh, I haven't got me to close. I appreciate your question. So we talk about post-normal science and we talk about transdisciplinarity, but when you sit in a room of scientists from a lot of different disciplines, they don't know how to talk to each other and they compete with each other around which orientation to the quote unquote problem is correct, right? So I think we need to heal the whole notion of there being an appropriate place for universities any longer. I think what we need is polyversity. A polyversity is a place where this is a land-grant institution. So really what it ought to be doing is sitting at the feet 
of communities and saying, what should we study today? What are the questions that are alive for you? And how do we partner in answering those questions on your terms at your pace? And I think that's what the academy needs to become. Universities, when they first started, were transdisciplinary. Everybody studied everything. And then over time, as social complexity increased, we started you know, segregating everybody into epistemic apartheid. And the epistemic apartheid has fed ecological apartheid. So we're apart from the earth, we're apart from each other, we're apart from our own sacred spirit. And you have to ask yourself, if we're apart from all of those things that make life beautiful, what the fuck are we doing? <laughs> we need to get back to sanity. <laughs> no, I think that Sam put it very beautifully about the grand challenge. Uh, what problem are you solving? I think that the solutions come very easily, but uh, the definition of the problem is more problematic. And over there, I think, as we said, we need to, and I just heard that this is actually not a land grant, this is a stolen land university. Mm -hmm. And that might be a good place to start, is to acknowledge the debt, to repent for it, and to say we will make reparations by actually making this, this space relevant to communities. And to, if it is a place of learning, then the learning needs to be also from the people who actually have something to teach us. And so it would be useful to look at how the space can be used for, for a different kind of expert to come in, experiential experts to come in and share with the students, to share with the other people, and to have crowds this large coming in and listening to them. What I am speaking is actually stuff that, parts of stuff that have been learned from other people who have been kind enough to talk to us about it. And I think that uh, if they don't come here, then we should go seeking them out. And the, the university or the multiversity uh, should uh, facilitate that kind of uh, an interaction. This, the second thing that I would like to just say in terms of, you know, how do we change the mindset? I would put my energy in talking to the young people because we're talking about a cultural change. We need to talk about investing in the next 40, 50 years. And uh, there is currently an opportunity with the Green New Deal. I think that while I have a lot of issues with it, it has kind of uh, created a rupture, it has created an opportunity, it has created a moment. Um, unfortunately, there are also a lot of young people who are going in it, uh, who, whose, whose sense of clarity needs to be complicated a little. And, uh, and when I say complicated, I don't mean to say confuse the little, uh, the young, young people, but to ask the questions because they would be in a better place to answer them because they are less fearful, they don't see it as a personal attack, and they're likely to come up with more creative ways um, because they've not yet lost their, I hope, their humility to learn from others. So I would say that we should all put in our energy into right now, looking at how we can have this whole opportunity of Green New Deal to begin that debate that this the Green New Deal, the document and what it talks about is incomplete and is likely to be another disaster. But it has good elements in it as well, because at least it is talking about the rights of communities, lip service or more, there are things in it. So the whole question about whether prosperity is the problem or poverty is the problem needs to be looked at. I think that prosperity is at the root of the problem. When we, we have this festival called Diwali, which is a time when you burn up a lot of money by buying firecrackers, and the person whose uh, the house front has the largest amount of trash is the coolest guy because you know yeah. you, you obviously burnt a lot of money and that means you have a lot of money and those who don't have money usually steal trash from somebody else's house and put it outside our house they put, put it outside their house but the point that i'm trying to make is you need to have with today's money is tomorrow's garbage if you if you don't have money you cannot create garbage and if you don't have money you can't cause crime and climate change so there's a direct function between prosperity and the amount of damage that you do so there is also a certain amount of valorizing of simplicity. I'm not talking about starvation or poverty. But I'm talking about simplicity and being able to, you know, enjoy the good things in life, which all come for free, which is relationships and most of the stuff that nature's services, ecosystem functions all do come for free if you maintain it. So I would say, you know, go to the young people and seek their help. Thank you.